uh, who has been here with us, working in two capacities, our musicians who have been sharing with us. We thank God for them being with us through this pandemic season, that we're still believing God and still in worship. And so we bring to you our own Sister Lashana Bellinger, who will lead us in praise and worship.
to you from the Nia Fellowship Baptist Church, West Orange, New Jersey, 174 South Valley Road in West Orange, the only African American Baptist Church. If you're looking for one in this area, we are here to serve you, to bless you, tell somebody. We are live, we are on the air. We thank God for you. I will worship the one who calmed the raging sea. I will worship the one who hushed the rage in me. My hands I lift to you. My voice I lift to you. My heart I lift to you. I will worship you. Join me as we enter the realm of worship. <laughs>
but we are making sure that when everybody gets back here, everybody is healthy, everybody is safe in the midst of worship. Yes, we will have protocol, but we want you to come back to a safe social distancing place where we can still give God the glory, give God the honor, and give God the praise. There are yet many who are in the need of prayer. And we ask that you would continue to pray for those who are yet going through. Our country is in the need of prayer. We have a pandemic and we have an epidemic. Pandemic of COVID-19 and an epidemic of injustice that has been happening for a long time. We'll be talking about just recent events in Atlanta, Georgia, where it still has not stopped. Still seeing black men being killed for no reason. We have to pray for them and pray for our families and pray for those who are causing this problem. We have to pray for our church mothers who get home praying for us. We pray for our seniors who are the most challenged during this season that they will stay safe since they are the ones who are considered to be at danger in this pandemic season. We have to pray because things are opening up, but it doesn't mean that COVID-19 has gone anywhere. I'm asking a special prayer for my wife, Lady Dr. Gwendolyn Platt, as she prepares for surgery on tomorrow. We ask that you would keep her in your prayers. We come believing God, singing a simple song that we often sing in church. The song is Precious Memory.
that these are difficult days and difficult times. But God, we ask that you would continue to provide us with your strength. Look over our young people, Lord. We know you're doing that, but we're asking that they will feel your presence, that they will feel your presence in the midst of them being disappointed about graduations and proms and some of the things that they were expecting to have. God, cover them and encourage them and let them know a great day is coming. And it's coming because they continue to trust in you that everything will be all right. God, as you continue to hover around us, we ask that they would feel you in the hospital rooms and they would feel you in the nursing homes. They would feel you in the rehabilitation centers. They would feel you in the prisons. And God, we ask that you would just hover over those who long for your presence to be able to share with them that your Holy Spirit is with them and that it will keep them and it will strengthen them. God, look over our congregation. Oh God, even though we preach to empty pews this morning, we know we're preaching to a host of people who have collectively come together to hear your word over the Facebook Live. God, let them know that we're still having church. The building may be closed, but the church is still open in their hearts. And God, let them know they are the church and that they should be worshiping you in spirit and in truth, not just today, but on every day. God, we believe that you're going to continue to do what you said you would do. And God, we trust in that promise because you've already made a way out of no way. Keep us, Lord. Protect us, Lord. And keep our minds in the right place. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Amen and thank God. We thank God for all that has been done and everything that we have been doing. Uh, everything that God has blessed us with. This is our giving time, and we thank God for our giving because our giving has afforded us an opportunity to continue to keep the lights on in the building, to continue to take care of the finances of the church, to pay our mortgage, and, and make sure that we are making the repairs that are needed so that we can continue to be a community church. We thank you for your giving. Your giving is not in vain. We thank you for those who have decided during this season that you will be consistent givers to us. We thank you for your tithes. We thank you for your offering and sowing the seed. We ask that in your giving, you would go to Givelify. You can find it at our website, www.neafellowshipbc.com. You can find it on your Facebook page and, and just uh, share with us your gift, your, your donation, your tithes, your offering. Do not forget that we have a benevolence, and if you want to, there is a memo place where you give your giving and just designate what amount you want to go to our benevolent offering, what you want to go to our scholarship offering. I'm so proud that we have a scholarship in the name of my mother, the late Thelma B. McCrimmon. We ask that you would contribute to our scholarship fund, and we ask that you would contribute to our Sunday school fund. We have been blessed that people have been giving to that. We have our Sunday school Bible study on Tuesday nights, and so we ask that you would join us with that too. But your giving, your giving is a blessing to us, and we pray that you would continue to give. We have a, a giving declaration where we believe in God. If you come to our church, you will see that posted somewhere. We are believing God for checks in the mail, gifts and surprises, debts paid off, expenses decreased, blessings and increased, a personal financial budgeting plan to properly manage the finances in your life. Yes, we got to believe God for that. We believe God for the favor of God, and we believe God for miracles. Every day is a new miracle that we sometimes forget that God is making your way out of nowhere. Thank you, Lord, in advance for meeting all of our financial need that we may have more than enough to give into the kingdom of God and promote the gospel of Jesus Christ. And those of us who have gotten to have a relationship with God with our giving, we take the next step and we have our deep free pledge to become debt free. If you want to join me as we make this pledge, I pledge to apply God's strategy for managing my money. I pledge to keep my expenses below my income. That way we can manage ourselves. I pledge to pay my bills on time. 
because we want good credit so we can get good things. I pledge to invest in assets that grow in value. Assets that grow in value. We want to make sure that we are investing in the stock market if we can. We're investing in good insurance plans if we can. We're investing in our children's college education, not waiting till they get to high school or middle school, but doing it now. I pledge to contribute to my church and its ministries. We ask that you would join us in making those pledges and that your giving would be a blessing to us. Please sow a seed into our ministry. We have created another ministry called the Near Purpose Partnership that has been designated for our church improvement. And we ask that if you want to give to that, just put NPP, Near Purpose Partnership, and we would definitely appreciate you helping us in that effort. We know that God has blessed us for giving, and we know that it's better to give than to receive. And because of that, we thank him in advance. This is how we do it in here. Just want to thank you.
saying yes to you, Lord. We thank our media specialist, Shana Bellinger, for pouring her spirit out to us. Uh, much of this comes in a last minute notice. We are getting prepared, and that's what we want to meet about as a church as we get to be more formal in preparing ourselves. But I want you to know that the people who are here are always ready to give and ready to do what God has called for them to do. And I thank them so much for supporting me in this effort. If we would, we will go to the Word of God. We ask that you would turn your Bibles to the book of Numbers. We have just one brief scripture for you coming from the book of Numbers. Chapter 32, verse 13. The book of Numbers. It's a blessing that we don't have to do when we were younger. We would flip through the Bible, but right now you can either just type it in. The book of Numbers, chapter 32, verse 13. And the word of the Lord reads, And the Lord's anger was kindled against Israel and made them wander in the wilderness forty years until all the generation that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was gone. And the word of the Lord is blessed. I come to preach to you from the subject, marching and not wandering to Zion. Marching and not wandering to Zion. Let us pray. Eternal God, I thank you for your mercy and your grace. God, I thank you for this awesome responsibility called preaching. God, I do not take it lightly, and I always come believing that there's a word that you have given me for your people. Not my word, but your word. So God, I ask that you would stand up and sit me down. Hide me behind the cross and allow the people to see and hear you and not me. So that their lives will be changed, transformed, but most of all blessed. And that someone will be saved because of it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. Marching and not wandering to Zion. Lord laid this on my heart and it's something that I had uh, looked at before and looking at this portion of scripture and thinking about all that we're going through it made me reflect on the great march on Washington because it was one of the largest political rallies of human rights in the United States history called and it called for the civil and economic rights for African Americans reminds us a lot today it took place in Washington, D.C. on Wednesday, August 28, 1963. Martin Luther King Jr. stood in front of the Lincoln Memorial and delivered his historic I Have a Dream speech advocating racial harmony during the march. The march was organized by a group of civil rights, uh, labor, and religious organizations under, under the same idea and theme of jobs and freedom. Estimates of the number of participants vary from 200,000 to 300,000 observers, and it estimated that 75 to 80% of the marchers were black. I come to tell you that we've been marching for a long time. 1995, I participated in the Million Man March where we declared that a million men would stand in that same area on the mall, believing that God would make a way out of nowhere. And when I think about the, the March of 1963, it was impactful because it widely credited, it is widely credited with helping to pass the Civil Rights, uh, 1964 Civil Rights and Voting Rights Act 1965. But unfortunately, here we are, 57 years later, planning another march on Washington on August 28th to come where we would again declare that we need to move in another direction. And, and just at the end of this month in June, uh, June the 20th, I believe, or 22nd, there's a poor people's campaign march. And we're marching and marching because we have some of the same issues. You know, this time in August 2020, the march will be held in the midst of and on the back end of racial tensions of frustrated black and white young people protesting 
in the Black Lives Matter movement. They're tired of the injustice in this country when it comes to black people. It is ironic that at this time, you know, Martin Luther King also talked about being able to see little white boys and little white girls walking together. Well, we're going to see a great, a great uh, gathering of young black and white people who are saying they're tired and they want this justice system to change. Because today we still do not have the kind of racial harmony that Dr. King dreamed of for our country. He dreamed that we would have it one day, and I argue that we don't have it because we have had an Israelite spirit in the body of Christ. We have had an Israelite spirit in police policy. Yes, 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 we have had an Israelite spirit in our own individual pursuits for justice. We just won't listen to the voice of God. We stop marching and we have began to wander. And to wander means to walk or move in a leisurely or casual or aimless way. And we have been wandering for the past 55 years in a broken system of justice that has caused people of color to be concerned about whether they should call the police for help or just take matters into their own hands. Just two nights ago, wandering people called the police on a man by the name of Rayshard Brooks who fell asleep while possibly, just possibly, being intoxicated in his car. And the wandering police came and the wandering police killed the man because he resisted and ran away from an arrest that should not have been attempted for falling asleep in his car and possibly being intoxicated, not driving while he was intoxicated, but sitting in his car intoxicated when the police would knock on the window and have him move his car. If they thought that that was an issue, then they should have gotten him some help. Why could they not have just said, well, you know what, we'll call a Lyft or we'll call an Uber to get you to where you're supposed to be? Why couldn't somebody have just talked to the man? What kind of attitudes has our country created because of a broken justice system? What kind of attitude that we have that we find ourselves calling the police then videotaping what the police do when we could have not made the call and just helped somebody before we called them to come. Where have we gotten and how have we gotten to this place of glad you asked? We have created attitudes of hopelessness and recklessness that causes business buildings to be burned down and looted because the people who normally help these have now left them unprotected and vulnerable to people with bad attitudes trying to send a message of we're tired. I cannot have it in this justice system anymore. Cannot have it this way. Nobody can have it this way. In fact, if you're not, this is what they're saying, if you're not going to make it right for me, then I'm going to make sure that it's not right for anybody. That message only repeats a behavior that has been created and has created the wandering that has existed for 50 plus years. Think about it, 50 plus years, we should be in a better situation now. 50 plus years, things should be different now. I have to give a shout out to the city of Newark because after 50 plus years, they had a protest and they did not have any violence that happened in the protest. But what happened to the mind of people who when they see that, that they can't see it as model behavior? Well, I tell you, go to the text. I'm in the book. In the text, the Lord led the Israelites through the wilderness to prevent them from going back into Egypt. And it took 40 years to get there. The Bible says the Lord's anger was 
was kindled against Israel and he made them wander in the wilderness for 40 years until all the generation had that had done evil in the sight of the Lord was gone. In other words, until all of those who had done evil in the sight of the Lord were dead. The reason the Lord led them around in circles for 40 years is because they were like some of us. Yes, oh, some things don't change. He led them around for 40 years because they were stubborn, disobedient, rebellious, ungrateful, unfaithful, wicked, and stiff-necked people who complained incessantly and were constantly ungrateful for the good things that the Lord had done for them. Oh, that looks like 2020 to me. The God has allowed some things to happen because some of you didn't come to church with the right attitude. In fact, some of you watching me now didn't come to church at all. And God is tired of it. And he has allowed certain things to happen. And I come to tell you, uh, I don't know about you, uh, but I don't want to wander forever. I want to see the salvation of the Lord. Amen. Could that be why we are still struggling today? Could that be why we're still in a struggling state? Could it be our attitude causing our journey in the wilderness of injustice to be longer than it should be? Do we have the right attitude to make the kind of change that would destroy our broken system of justice? Do we have the right attitude to make change to the way we think about how we treat people in this country and how we treat people in our community? Can we change the mentality of a police system that says shoot first? Can we change the mentality of an officer who because his pride is kicked in because this man has out tussled him and somebody else instead of allowing their physicality and their mind to kick in and take off and chase somebody without a gun that they don't want to run and chase and have a conversation. They want to pull out their gun and shoot and stop it. Those are some questions that we must deal with as the church, and those are some questions we must deal with individually, and those are some questions that we need to deal with in our community, but before we even make an effort to be impactful in our march for justice, we must dig deeper. We need to do a deeper check on ourselves. Somebody said, check yourself before you wreck yourself. If you are facing a personal struggle in your life, perhaps the problem isn't what you think it is. Many times we focus on another person or a situation and we think that is what's causing us to be unhappy. No, I'm coming to tell you something. The real issue might be that you personally have a bad attitude and have not checked yourself. It may seem like your problem is your spouse. It may seem like your problem is your children. It may seem like your problem is somebody who you work with, your coworker, the economy, your job, your church, or even the justice system, who we all want to get mad now because of the justice system. But actually, you might be wandering around in wilderness, unable to find your own personal promised land because your attitude I, I want to say something else, but I'll say it this way. Your attitude stinks. Come on, okay. You know, there, there are a couple other words we can use, but, but your attitude stinks. And, and because your attitude stinks, nothing else can work for you. You criticize and you complain about everything. Everything is everybody else's fault but yours. You don't know how to talk or treat people because you don't like you. And you don't even know it. Some of y'all get that when you go in the kitchen. You, it'll hit you. Uh, you don't even like you, and you don't even know it. You look in the mirror, and you see something different other than what's there. Many of us in society have just been just like the Israelites. Nothing new. We blame the things that are wrong in our life on an outward circumstance instead of looking at what's in our heart. I'm looking for some people with a heart. I'm looking for some people who are trying to get it in their heart. I'm sick and tired of people trying to show me 
in the physical. I'm sick and tired of people trying to tickle my ears with what they think I want to hear. I want to know where is your heart. There must be a transformation in your heart, in our heart, that we embrace before we can even attempt to help someone else or even make an effort to make change. We can learn a lot about the importance of a good attitude by looking at the Israelites. Maybe you didn't read deep enough or you didn't do any your biblical research, but the Bible says there was about 1.5 million people who came out of Egypt. God delivered them from slavery and led them on a journey to their promised land, a place described as flowing with milk and honey. The trip should have taken 11 days. Instead, it took 40 years. Somebody knows what I'm talking about. Something that you could have got done in a weekend has ended up taking you longer than it should have taken. Why did that happen? Well, go to Numbers 14, and we see the people who are continuously grumbling and complaining about everything. They even complained about the bread that God miraculously provided for them. Anytime something difficult crossed their path, they were ready to give up and go back to Egypt, back to slavery. I believe that they did not even realize the impact of their own mentality. A poor mentality will take you nowhere and keep you bound just like a slave and you don't have to move at all. You don't believe me? Just practice the, the, the belief of I don't care. Three of the dangerous words you can ever say. Because when you say you don't care, you are opening yourself up to be a danger to somebody or somebody to be a danger to you. What's astounding is that out of 1.5 million people who left Egypt, only two from the original group made it to the promised land. Oh, you don't believe me? Go, go, go back and read. It seems even today there are many believers who have escaped Egypt, which represents their former life of slavery to sin and slavery to the broken system of justice we live under. But unfortunately, many have escaped and not realized it. They continue to be the kind of people that are always looking toward their personal promised land but seem to end up wandering around the same mountains in their entire life dealing with the same problems and having the same issues. If you got the same issues in 2020 that you had in 2000 and the same issues that you had in 1980, then the problem is not everybody else. The problem is you. I come today to ask somebody some questions. Are you one of those people do you feel like you've been going around the same mountain long enough? Are you marching for the better or wandering for the worse? I'll say it again. Are you marching for the better or are you wandering for the worse? While growing with God as I grew up, uh, uh, I, 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 I still felt challenged by life circumstances. And then one day I realized that I was wandering around in a wilderness of my own carnality. What do you mean, Pastor Flatter? Well, yeah, that, that, that's what the wilderness is. Uh, it's fleshly living that lets your soul or your mind or your will or your emotions be in control of you. And you got to stop letting the stuff that's inside of you control you and let God be in control. Too many of us are driven by passion. Uh, too many of us are, uh, 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 are driven because uh, we feel fleshy. Uh, oh, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, I'm on your street. You know what it's like to feel fleshy. Uh, and you just uh, say, I'm going to say what I'm going to say. And I'm going to cuss about it anyway. Feeling fleshy uh, and doing things that you really shouldn't be doing. Feeling fleshy uh, and allowing your mind to pull you in place. Uh, and then you want to go cry and have a pity party and say, God, uh, I don't know what it is. And if you would sit down and let go and let God have his way, he can help you change. Amen. But I'm sad to say, some of us 
don't want to change. You know why? Because we like feeling that way. We like feeling that way until it becomes a detriment to us. We like feeling that way until it affects our relationships. We like feeling that way until it affects how we get our money and how we're able to survive. And then we want to go run into God. We don't realize that this leads to a lousy attitude. Yes, some of you, even our children, you got a lousy attitude not because of what mom and daddy did. You got a lousy attitude because you know how you are. You got a lousy attitude because you know the issues that you're dealing with. Uh, yeah, I'm talking to you young people. You got a lousy attitude uh, not because uh, uh, your uh, daddy's not in the house, uh, not because mom and daddy broke up. You got a lousy attitude because of your own condition. And the only way you can change it is with God. Because when your soul is in control, you are not submitting your thoughts to Christ. You are submitting your thoughts to what's inside of you. And if nothing good is inside of you, then nothing good is going to come out of you. That means you are not thinking and acting like God wants you to act. You have to let the Lord work in your soul. He wants to change your attitude by changing the way you think. It seems that we have forgotten the simple exercise of asking ourselves, what would Jesus do? And how would Jesus do it? Go ahead, ask yourself. Think about what you're going through and say, what would Jesus do? And how would Jesus do it? If you're challenged and frustrated in these times, God is telling you that you need to get a new attitude. I think somebody wrote a song about that. I think it was Patty Robel. Uh, talk about a head to her shoes. Uh, she had a new attitude. Uh, oh, I know that ain't scripture, but some of y'all need to go back and listen to that. You need to get a new attitude. Uh, if you look up, uh, I'll give you some scripture. Ephesians, uh, the fourth chapter, verses 22 to 24. I'll read it from the Amplified Version. You can read it later. Strip yourselves of your former nature. Put off and discard your old, unrenewed self, uh, which characterized your previous manner of life and becomes corrupt through lust and desires that spring from delusion and be constantly renewed in the spirit of your mind, having a fresh mental and spiritual attitude and put on the new nature, the regenerated self, created in God's image, uh, God-like, in true righteousness and holiness. That's the word of God. In these verses, God uh, lovingly asks us to stop acting like we used to act. Uh, this takes effort uh, on our part, but God's grace and his help. With his grace and with his help, we can change. Uh, the key is to constantly renew your mind each day with God's word. There is nothing new under the sun. The Bible is still teaching us uh, after 2,000 years, uh, the answer lies in the word of God. Uh, although I've been preaching uh, and I've been in church uh, all these years, I still have to make a daily decision to renew my mind with God's word. Uh, God has brought me a long way uh, and some things are easier now than before, but guess what? Uh, I haven't arrived yet. I'm sorry. Uh, I would love to be that preacher to say that I've arrived yet and that I'm so holy, but no, I haven't arrived yet. My learning is in a continuous state uh, and that's some of your problem. You think because you're an officer in the church that you're arrived. Some of you think because you've got a title because you're a preacher that you're arrived. Uh, I come to tell you, give you a news flash. Uh, no, there's some continuous When I need to take off uh, my old nature and put on the new nature of Christ, uh, it's part of a lifelong journey. We all have to walk with the Lord. Uh, and so I come to let you know Dr. King understood that. Dr. King understood 52 years ago when toward the end of his I Have a Dream speech, Dr. King refers to the threats against his life and uses language that prophetically foreshadowed his impending death, but affirming and reaffirming that he was not afraid to die. You see, that's the problem we have when we look at our young people protesting. You don't understand that we got some young people out there on the line, they're not afraid to die. They're not afraid to die because they are standing for something and standing for something that they don't understand, some stuff that we put on them. And I tell you, young people, that's all right to be that way and you keep moving forward, but don't do it without God. Dr. King says, 
Well, I don't know what will happen next. We've got some difficult days ahead. But it really doesn't matter to me now because I've been to the mountaintop. And I don't mind like anybody. I would love to like, I would love to live a long life. Longevity has its place. But I'm not concerned about that now. I just want to do God's will. Oh, put a pin in that. How many of us really want to do God's will? Or are we doing our will? And he's allowed me to go up to the mountain. And I've looked over and I've seen the promised land. I, I may not get there with you, but I want you to know tonight he said that we as a people will get to the promised land. Oh, oh, we as a people will get to the promised land. So I'm happy tonight, he said. I'm not worried about anything. I'm not fearing any man. My eyes have seen the glory of the coming of the Lord. At that point, Dr. King had become completely like Christ. I guess, I guess some of you didn't realize that. Uh, and he didn't even realize that because he had let go everything. Uh, he had done like the psalmist said this morning in the, in the psalmonic selection. He had given himself away. Uh, the frustration and the anger was no longer his God because he had submitted to the will of God. And I come to ask you, have you submitted to God's will? Have you submitted to God's will in your march for change in your personal life or in your march for justice or in your march for, for what you think you need to do? Or are you mad just because mad makes you feel good? I'm tired of people on, on Facebook talking about, I'm mad, I'm mad, I'm angry. Well, then do something about it. you got to change. Oh, I'm coming to tell you. I'm done now. Uh, as I close, somebody needs to know that as you become more like Christ, you'll get closer to the promised land God has for you. you got to renew your mind with God's word every day. And the journey will be less of a challenge to you. Uh, it's time, church. Uh, it's time, Nia. It's time, friends. Uh, it's time to become more like Christ. Uh, I know uh, we look at this, 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 this Christ that we have in our mind, uh, and we look at him on the cross, uh, and we look at what we learn. Uh, but I'm telling you, uh, oh, we are looking at him in the image and on pictures, uh, but we got to do what Jesus did, uh, and we got to move like Jesus moved. Uh, it's time for us to move. From demonstration to legislation. It's time for us to move from marching to mobilizing. It's time for us to help people like Rayshard Brooks before we call the police and video to, and video people like Rayshard Brooks. Call the police. Put yourself, don't call the police. Put yourself on down and go over and talk to somebody. Those are the kind of changes that we need. I learned from my nephew Manoa and my nephew Mosi that we might have to stop calling the police for every little thing until we are sure we will get help from the police and not hurt by the police or killed by the police. Young people I know is sick and tired of being sick and tired of seeing black men get killed for absolutely nothing. So I come to serve you a notice. You have to start marching with the purpose and stop wandering with a defeated attitude. Stop trying to fight hate with hate. Start believing deep in your heart that someday is not soon, but someday is not sometime, but someday is already here. Start seeing your change like Dr. King and start believing if I die, I'm going to live again. Start believing you are marching to Zion, a real place, a real refuge. Start believing if you don't get there, your people will get there. Believe that there 
But these descriptions are it is rational to assume that Zion is the location of Christ rule on earth during the millennial kingdom. Come on in Revelation now. Yeah, come on, Revelation. Repeatedly with the nation of Israel, it's favored or promised future glory. Zion is mentioned. Zion is a place from which the Lord has commanded blessing.
Jesus. 